Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to our fourth Lunch and Learn of the Month and happy Kansas Ag Day and National Ag Day. We're glad that you could join us today. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Yumi Gleason and I'm the From the Land of Kansas Marketing Coordinator with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Um, we are excited you have joined this Lunch and Learn. This program is made possible by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant. The Specialty Crop Block Grant makes funds available to state departments of agriculture solely to enhance competitiveness of specialty crops. According to the USDA, specialty crops are defined as fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, and nursery crops, including floriculture. Also, the Kansas Department of Agriculture is currently accepting 2022 specialty crop block grant applications. If you'd like to complete an application, my uh, coworker will put the link in the chat. Now I'm going to turn it over to Janelle to review some housekeeping items with us. Janelle? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you've been on this couple of weeks with us, you know the regular housekeeping ones and you've been doing a great job of keeping yourself muted during the presentation, other than if you're asking a question and you can drop those in the chat. And my coworker from the Kansas Department of Agriculture will keep track of all those and make sure we can get those asked and answered during the session. Also, um, the webinar is being recorded. The recordings will be available for a limited amount of time due to a contractual obligation with our speakers. The videos include copyrighted content and are made available for viewing by the Kansas Department of Agriculture only. So please do not record, sell, distribute, or share this video on social media sites. But recordings will be available to all of you by 5 p.m. this Friday. And we will drop a link in the chat to register for next week's webinar, which is on the importance of value-added products in our farm store. And also if you want to view recordings from any of the past three weeks. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sammy to introduce our great speaker for the day, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Thank you, Janelle. Today we have Josh, Josh Wolf with us. He is the author of two books, Compact Farms and Build Your Own Farm Tools, and is a regular sponsor to Growing for Market Magazine. He earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and after a short time designing tools for manufacturing, he started working on a small scale uh, vegetable farm for over 20 years. He currently manages an urban CSA in the neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, and does consulting under the name of Slowhand Farm. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Josh. Great. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to uh, primarily be on a PowerPoint slideshow today, um, which I'll start sharing in just a second. Um, so if you can bear with me for two seconds, I will get that load it up. Um, okay, so, oh, interesting. Um, all right, so I think that's, that's it right there. <clears throat> all right, so what I'm gonna talk about is designing, building and implementing tools and systems on the farm. And, um, Hold on, there we go. Okay, so um, Sammy actually just gave most of my background, but I'm going to kind of go back over that because I just, I like to, you know, start these presentations out saying, you know, this information is coming from someone in particular. And so keep that in mind, what my background is as it's going forward. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the basics of selecting tools, which is basically the same thing as when you're designing the tools. Um, and we'll do a couple of quick examples where I'll go through um, uh, three very different examples of tools that I've used around farms that I've worked on. Um, I want to touch on um, the some really fundamental pieces of physics and ergonomics that I keep in mind. And these are all in my book, Build Your Own Farm Tools, which came out last summer. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those slides. Um, and then we'll go through a bunch more examples of tools. Um, and then uh, at any point during this, this presentation, if you have questions, um, I think they're asking to put them up in the chat. Um, if there are clarification questions, they'll, they'll kind of uh, ask me right away. Um, and if, uh, if there are questions for kind of the end of the presentation, um, I'm gonna try and leave plenty of time at the end to uh, talk about um, whatever it is that people are interested in, in terms of designing, building, implementing, buying, 
uh, tools for your own farm. Okay, so um, again, on my background, bicycle mechanic is my background. Growing up in urban areas, not on the farm, and I think that this is you know kind of increasingly uh, common within farming. <clears throat> so it wasn't necessarily the case longer ago, but um, I started working in factories straight out of mechanical engineering degree um, and realized that was not really what I wanted to do. And food production was more interesting to me in a community setting, um, kind of as a community building tool in a lot of ways. Um, also, just as a way for me to eat really well. Um, and so I've spent the last 23, farm, 23 years working on small farms, kind of learning from different farms around the country, doing lots and lots of farm tours um, of farms of all different scales. Um, and, you know, continuing with the, the machine design background, always thinking about the systems that the tools that we're using are fitting into and designing and kind of improving, modifying tools around the farm, uh, farms that I've been working on. Um, and then I've also for the past uh, 15 years or so been doing a lot of writing, um, initially, that was um, blog posts and contributions to Growing for Market, which is a fantastic um, journal. And um, I've continued kind of on and off with the Growing for Market thing and, and uh, added two books to that mix. Um, so one which profiles farms that are all under five acres that I felt uh, were interesting examples of all the different ways or lots of the different ways that, that these farms uh, work out. And then the follow-up to that, build your own farm tools, was kind of getting back into that machine design uh, arena and you know saying these are things that you can build. And that's what I'm really gonna talk about today. So <clears throat> some basics on selecting and designing tools. Um, the, the first thing I'm always thinking about is just what is the task that we're trying to accomplish? Um, and how, you know, kind of when I'm looking at the tool, thinking about how does that tool improve the process? And a big part of that improvement for me is not just the efficiency of getting the product produced, but it's also kind of how the people fit into that system. So the people who are working, um, you know, also the, the consumers on the other end, potentially. So is it, you know, is it producing a better product, but also is it making things easier for the people who are doing the work of getting the product produced. Um, so along those lines, fit and ergonomics are really important. Flexibility and versatility is, an, uh, is actually a different thing from that. And what that is, is thinking about, is the tool a really specialty tool where it's gonna do just one task or is it something that's flexible and ver or versatile? There's a number of different uh, tasks that it could be accomplishing um a uh, number of different products that I could be using it on <clears throat> um another important consideration especially on small farms like the one that I, I work on right now we have very limited storage so you know what is the tool going to be doing when it's not being used is it taking up really valuable space um you know either you know kind of in the corner of a barn or in your packing shed or you know wherever that might be do you even have a place to put it if it's something that needs to be out of the elements? Um, <clears throat> construction and materials, of course, are really important. And it's not to say that any one of these is like more is better. So it doesn't need to be heavier. Um, sometimes lighter is better, but sometimes heavier is better. But thinking about things like weight, strength, uh, stiffness, toughness, um, you know, all those different factors when you're both designing and selecting the tool that you're going to be using. Maintenance and repair. Um, you know, is it something that's maintainable or is it a, you know, one-time use thing or, you know, is it going to last for a year? Is it going to last for many years? Again, one's not necessarily better than the other. Um, it depends on the particular situation. And so just thinking about, you know, how does this fit into the systems that you have on your own farm. And then of course the financial piece is really important. So the price of the tool upfront is going to, you know, influence your decisions around cash flow. So do you actually have the cash up front? Do you have some way to finance it and buy that up front? Um, and so that's you know maybe the first question to ask. Um, but certainly also you want to consider, is this something that's going to have a return on the investment? Are you going to be able to eventually pay that off? 
Um, and that may be financially, hopefully it's financially, but there might also be other ways that you're paying that off. It's just in terms of um, your experience, the experience of your employees, you know, whoever is working with you around the farm, there are certainly tools that I have purchased just because they were going to make my life more comfortable, not necessarily because they were going to make me more money. Okay, so a really simple tool example to start out with. Um, this is one that, <clears throat> you know, most people are going to be familiar with. Um, one that on the small scale farm I use all the time. Um, which is a hoe. This is my friend Kai using a, a, one of my favorite hoes, which is a swan neck hoe made by a company named DeWitt in the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> it's an appropriate design for the particular task that we are uh, trying to accomplish here, which is weeding between rows. And <clears throat> this particular hoe has uh, an appropriately sized blade um, it's the right width, it's the right weight, it's a well-balanced tool, it has a long handle, which is really um, good. You can see that he's standing completely upright, totally straight back. Um, that long handle is one of the things that's allowing that to happen, as well as the angle of the head, the way that the tool was designed. Um, uh, it's made out of durable materials. Um, it's got a quality steel forged head with a, a um, nice socket handle for the handle, which means that the handle is easily replaced um, and maintained. Um, the blade is made out of a steel uh, and a quality steel that's easy to sharpen and resharpen. <clears throat> um, and it's not an inexpensive hoe as hoes go, but the amount of time that we spend with this hoe and the amount of work that we got do with it definitely make it worthwhile. <clears throat> Another totally different example um, here is uh, this benchtop scale. So the benchtop scale, uh, what that is, and I'm not sure if you guys can see this or not, but there's a, uh, I'm putting my cursor over top of the benchtop scale. It's just that little stainless platform right there, kind of at knee height. <clears throat> um, and uh, then it has a little wire that goes up and the display is at eye level. Uh, mounted to the wall. These are really common scales. You'll see them at the post office, um, you know, shipping centers, that kind of thing. That's typically where they're used. Um, this particular one um, is a less expensive model, not because it's not uh, durable and, you know, totally suited to our use, but because it's not, um, uh, it's not accurate enough for commercial use but we're not using it for a commercial use. We are using it to just track our own um, yield information. So what's coming out of the field and we just need a rough number for that. We don't need uh, a number on a certified scale because we're not selling directly off of that scale. We have a different certified scale for that use. So this is where the dirty produce comes in from the field and we'll put that down there. I have created kind of a system around this. So anytime you're buying the tool, the tool is going to be incorporated into a system. And part of the system on this tool is where it's placed. So it's placed just inside the barn door, essentially, where all the produce is already coming past. It's set at a level so that when somebody is carrying one of our harvest containers um, with fairly straight arms, the bottom of that container is essentially where the scale is. So they don't really have to lift that container up. They also don't have to bend over to put it down onto the scale. So it's set at a good working height. And then, like I mentioned, the display is up at eye level. <clears throat> um, that means that they don't have to bend over to read that. It makes it easy, uh, less eye strain. It's in a well-lit area so you can see what you're doing. And then we've built a little standing desk right next to it. And that's where we have clipboards uh, for writing down what the uh, product was that was coming in, how much weight it was, and that way we're keeping track of everything. So that's something we wanted to do on that particular farm. And so we set up the systems around that. Um, purchase the appropriate materials in order to build the, the tool in the system and incorporate that tool which is a scale into that system. Okay, uh, let's do one more quick example and then I'm gonna go <clears throat> into some other 
background information. So this is a this is a tool that I've worked with a lot in terms of uh, both using on the farm, but also thinking about the design and um, making tweaks to the design. So the, the cart in the back is a really ubiquitous cart on a lot of farms that, but certainly all the farms that I've worked on and a lot of farms that I visit, they're really commonly available. They're ca called garden carts a lot of times. Um, Vermont cart was one of the brands that, that built them. Uh, for many years. I think there's a lot of different folks making them now in numerous variations. Um, and the, from a design perspective, in terms of kind of ease of manufacture, um, basic functionality, um, it's a really, really excellent design and <clears throat> um, it is really well made. So, um, the thing is, it wasn't made exactly <clears throat> um, for the the farm purposes that we were using it for. So what it was, what it's kind of best designed for is around the homestead, hauling firewood, maybe hauling compost or leaves or something like that. We're uh, in this particular case, you can see that we're we're sifting compost onto it, and it's actually pretty well designed for that purpose. But what we end up using it for mostly was um, hauling harvests in, uh, out of the field <clears throat> and tools into the field. And for that purpose, it was good, but it wasn't great. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I always wanted to improve on it was the wheel spacing and making the wheel spacing so that the wheels would ride in our beds. So the wheel spacing, I bumped it out to four feet, which was our bed center. And then I wanted a little bit more clearance. It was sitting a little bit too low to actually clear our beds, which are raised up a little bit and then <clears throat> have plants in them as well. The, so I moved the bed of the cart up. <clears throat> and again, uh, I'm thinking about the people that are gonna be using this and kind of how they're gonna be using it. Um, uh, so I set that bed height <clears throat> at that, distance more or less where the bottom of the uh, bin is going to be when you are standing up straight so that you don't really have to lift onto the cart and you don't have to bend over to put the thing in the cart you just kind of walk up to the cart and then it's and then let the thing go on the on the cart slide it onto the cart um, you can see that the garden cart has sides on it and that's great when you're trying to contain something that's loose but we are uh, putting bins on there, which are basically all already contained. And the garden cart also tips backwards when you lift up the handle because the handle is so low. Um, and uh, that would, if we had stacked bins, sometimes those stacks would fall over. So what I did was I made it so that the cart was slightly tipped forward towards the handle um, when it was just sitting. And then when you pick up the handle, it the bed is pretty flat. And that way, when you're rolling it, the, the uh, bins that you've loaded onto it don't tend to tip over. And with a simple, just uh, kind of low cleat, just a little uh, one inch lip around the edge, um, that's enough to keep the bins from sliding off of the cart. So, you know, a lot of different design features here. Another one is that that handle height is set so that you don't really have to bend over to pick up the handle. And when you are moving the cart, the handle is at about hip height. So you can push with your hips instead of pushing with your arms. Um, so a bunch of, bunch of different pieces like that. I used bicycle wheels instead of cart wheels because they, in our area, they're more commonly available. They roll a little bit smoother. Um, and they're easy to maintain. Uh, uh, not that the cartwheels aren't easy to maintain and they're actually becoming a lot more uh, commonly available than they were when I designed this cart, uh, which was probably over 15 years ago. Uh, in fact, it was, I think about 17 years ago at this point. Um, but still the bicycle wheels uh, have some advantage over the cartwheels, the cartwheels have some other advantages. Okay, so <clears throat> um, those are three examples. Let me switch gears here for a minute. 
and we'll come back to tools. Uh, but what I want to get into is um, a bit on ergonomics and efficiency. Um, and I put this quote up here as a reminder that, again, it's not necessarily just that you're trying to improve your production speed, make something faster, quicker. Um, in my mind, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to improve the life of the people who are working on the farm. <clears throat> and the way that we're doing that is by producing vegetables. And we are also trying to improve the lives of other people by producing the vegetables. So it's really about the people on the farm and the people that we're serving, not about the product itself. Although the product itself is very important. <clears throat> now, ergonomics is um, most commonly thought of as uh, you know, kind of setting things up so that they are safe, uh, especially, you know, preventing things like repetitive stress injuries and, and uh, you know, when you're sitting at your desk, sitting in an ergonomic, ergonomic way. But really what the root of the word is and what it's really about is efficiency and getting things done. And part of that efficiency is doing it in a healthy way that is sustainable. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk now about a couple of the I'm just going to, because we don't have very much time, um, this is a presentation that I often do over a number of hours, but I'm going to condense that all down into about uh, probably 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go through and just mention a bunch of the foundational concepts that I'm keeping in mind as I'm designing these tools, as I'm selecting tools, as I'm setting up the systems around using those designed and bought tools on the farm. So, um, uh, I, again, come from a mechanical engineering background and physics is, you know, kind of the basis of that. And I think a lot of people are scared off by physics, but really all the physics concepts are, are things that everybody experiences in everyday life. And it's a language, physics is a language that's been created to, um, to describe that very specifically. So these are all things that we all experience in everyday life all the time and can relate to, but maybe not in the language of physics. The language of physics helps us um, to be specific about describing them when we're talking about these other things. So things like mass and weight, force, um, equal and opposite reactions, what all these things mean, tension and the difference between tension and compression, tension just being pulling on something versus compression being pushing on something. Um, twisting and moment of inertia, which sounds, uh, <clears throat> twisting sounds totally normal that you, everybody gets that. Moment of inertia maybe doesn't sound as normal, but it's about how much force it takes essentially to twist something. And that has to do with the, not just <clears throat> the weight, um, so if you're pushing something that's heavy, it's harder to push. If you're trying to twist something to heavy, that's heavy, it's harder to twist. If you're pushing something that's heavy and different shapes, it doesn't really matter in terms of the, the amount of force. But if you're twisting something and it's different shapes, that does make a difference. So that's what that's describing. Um, things like leverage, which is very important. And I think everybody understands levers and has used levers, common seesaw on the Playground is a really great example of a lever. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to get into these very much, but you can also quantify work, <clears throat> which is basically the same units as force. Um, you can quantify power, <clears throat> which is just work over time. So it's the amount of force that you've put into something for the amount of time that you've put into it, loosely speaking. Um, and then things like momentum and kinetic energy are important. And, and you'll experience those when you're doing things like swinging a hammer. Um, so the hammer has a certain amount of momentum and it also has a certain amount of kinetic energy. And that has to do with how heavy the hammer is. It also has to do with the, the path that the hammer is following. Um, and it has to do with how quickly the hammer is moving. <clears throat> On basic body mechanics, <clears throat> Um, you can start thinking about those previous uh, physics concepts also in terms of how the body is reacting. And, and, um, and then you also want to understand a little bit about uh, the structure of the body. 
um, so that there are four, four, curve, four natural curves in the spine. So if you're standing straight up, you are not standing with a, a back that's straight like a ruler is straight. You're standing with a back that actually has four curves in it. <clears throat> and that's the sacral curve, which is down um, kind of at your tailbone, uh, the lumbar curve, which is your lower back, the thoracic curve, which is um, behind your rib cage, um, and then the cervical curve, which is in your neck. <clears throat> and those kind of go back and forth. And, um, and so you want to be maintaining those curves as much as possible through all the motions that you're doing. And as you move your back, <clears throat> the back has very, it has a lot of joints in it. So there's a bunch of different um, bones in there and they each have a little pad in between them. And you're compressing that pad anytime you come out of that natural curve. And the more you twist and the more you bend the back in, in, in either forwards or backwards, the more pressure you are exerting on those little pads. And those pads have a limit of how much pressure they'll take. So <clears throat> if you also are lifting a lot of weight, that weight, <clears throat> if it's uh, held above your hips, so if you're not holding it on your hips, but you're holding it with your arms, then that weight is being uh, is compressing the spine. <clears throat> and so you are already are compressing those pads a little bit. And if you start to bend over, then that creates even more compression on one side of the pad. And so that's what you're trying to avoid um, with a lot of the motions. The back, I, I'm spending a little bit more time on the back because the back injuries are one of the worst <laughs> and more, most common injury um, and the hardest to recover from. And I, I say that from my own personal experience, but also that seems to be the, the consensus around the, the literature. Um, <clears throat> all of your joints can be in compression or tension, not just the back. <clears throat> um, typically where you want to be working, and again, this is similar to the spine. So I'm saying you wanna be working with that spine in a neutral position, meaning that it's kind of in the middle of its range. It's not too far bent forward, it's not too far bent back, it's in that normal space that you would be if you were straight up and down, which is kind of in the middle of your range of motion. You can think about it the same way in terms of your arms. If you extend your arm as straight as possible, or then you um, do a curl and put your hand up as close to your shoulder as possible, those are the, extent, uh, the extremes of the range of motion, somewhere about halfway in between that where your arm's at about a 90 degree angle, that's the neutral joint position. That's kind of in the middle. And that middle range is typically where you want to be doing most of your work and where you're best supported by both the tendons and the ligaments. The tendons and the ligaments being, the tendon is what connects the muscles to the bones. The ligaments are what connect the bones to the bones. So you have these two different <clears throat> um, supporting mechanisms for the bones. The muscles are supporting it, but the ligaments are also supporting the joints. Um, <clears throat> you have long muscles and you have short muscles and the short muscles tend to stabilize things and the long muscles tend to generate most of the movement. So the long muscles being things like the biceps <clears throat> or the, the quadriceps in your legs, the short muscles um, being the little muscles around your back, <clears throat> uh, around your wrists, those kinds of things. Um, uh, and uh, there's tons and tons of muscles in your core, kind of generally around your pelvis that are all stabilizing both the, you know, kind of the back to the leg. Um, and so those are the types of muscles that you want to in, be able to activate and engage, even though they're not making major movements, um, they are helping to stabilize those joints as you move through motions in order to prevent injury. All of the muscles fatigue with the more work that you do. So, <clears throat> and, you know, kind of going back to that physics concept, uh, power being work over time. So if you're putting out low power, but over a long period of time, <clears throat> you're gonna get fatigued. If you're putting out high power over a short period of time, you're gonna get fatigued. So it's depending on how much work you're doing. The, the, um, uh, the muscles are not the only thing that fatigues, but as they fatigue, 
um, they are going to reduce the uh, level of support that they're offering to the joints. And so as you fatigue, you're more likely to get injured. Um, you're also um, less efficient um, and less accurate in what you are doing. So setting up your spaces um, in order to use as little movement and um, uh, do basically as little work as possible <laughs> um, uh, is going to help in terms of reducing the amount of fatigue and that's gonna allow you to work for longer. <clears throat> um, your vision will also fatigue um, and your mental acuity will also fatigue over time. So as you, as you get tired, the longer you do something. So those are things that you want to think about as well, setting up the spaces, making it easy to see what you're doing, proper lighting, um, uh, and <clears throat> also setting, you know, work limits in terms of, uh, the hours, giving rest breaks, those kinds of things ultimately help improve and designing your tools so that they facilitate those things and the systems and the spaces that you use those tools in. Okay, um, practice and training, those, <clears throat> those both help um, in terms of uh, increasing your, your peak ability, but also increasing your stamina, um, meaning that you can work for longer, decrease, that decreases strain, that decreases errors, it also helps avoid injury. <clears throat> Same as applicable in terms of the vision and the mental. Um, and then uh, on this concept, I, I also wanna talk about pain versus discomfort. And this is something that I have, uh, you know, kind of come to understand a little bit differently than when I was growing up. So there was the no pain, no gain <clears throat> mantra that I always heard in sports. Um, and I now think of it as no discomfort, no gain. Um, and I reserve pain for a signal that's uh, saying, uh, stop, you're either injuring yourself already or you're in imminent danger of injuring yourself. So discomfort is okay and that's to be expected. And that's when you're, you're kind of creating this situation where you're, you're building up your strength over time. Um, it's okay to be uncomfortable, but it's not okay to be in pain. Um, and so thinking about those things differently, I think is, is a good thing. And doing exercises and kind of just being, uh, creating an awareness uh, around where those limits are, are really important. Um, the last piece on this that I wanna talk about is probability and consequence. So this is something to keep in mind <clears throat> um, when you're designing the task, when you're doing tasks, um, but also in terms of the design of the tools themselves, um, and when you're, you're building things. So when you're thinking about risk, I think most people generally think about the probability and they think a little bit less about the consequence. Um, and uh, the two are Im important in combination. So if the consequence is low, um, it, it's less important whether or not the probability is uh, high or low. <clears throat> Um, if the consequence is high, it becomes a lot more important whether or not the probability is high or low. And if the consequence is high enough, you really want the probability to be essentially zero. Um, and so if you can eliminate, basically anytime you can eliminate a really high consequence, um, then you don't have to worry about the probability at all. Um, I think about that in building and designing tools where, <clears throat> Um, a lot of people will build something and it's like, oh, well, this is working for what I'm doing right now, um, but they're not designing it for the extreme situation. So it's like, well, this, yeah, this is working for what you're doing right now, but what is the possibility that it's going to see something more extreme? And, um, you know, with, with, and I'm going to get into tool examples here, so maybe I'll explain this more in a second, but, <clears throat> um, you know, with weather events and that kind of thing, um, putting up high tunnels is one of the things that I think a lot, a lot about. So somebody will put up a high tunnel and they won't build it as strong as it needs to be for an extreme weather event because that extreme weather event doesn't happen very often. The probability is fairly low on, on a daily basis, but the probability of it happening at some point during the lifetime of that is actually, uh, of that tunnel is actually fairly high. And so that is, <clears throat> Um, 
what you need to be designing for because the consequence of that tunnel failing is fairly significant, um, uh, potentially injuring people if in, people are around the tunnel at that point, um, but certainly just even in terms of the uh, cost of having to rebuild a tunnel. So that's one example of probability versus consequence. And I'll bring up some more of that in, in uh, these examples. Okay, so uh, I've got a picture of the spray table up here <clears throat> and I wanna um, point out a few things about this. This is a, this is a spray table um, at uh, the small farm that I work at right now, you know, sorting table. And it's um, uh, made with slats so that uh, there's a little space between those slats. I'm not sure if you can see that or not you know, from this particular photo, but I've got some more photos of this in a second. Um, and so we spray roots off on this and we do a bunch of sorting and the table itself is four feet wide. And that is a combination uh, of two things. So one is it's made out of lath and lath comes in four foot lengths, but four feet also is about an arm span. And that's kind of what Adrian is pointing out here. So we don't have to move very much from one end of the table to the other. And then we put these little low benches next to it so that we don't have to, uh, we don't have to um, kind of reach up and over. Um, we don't have to lift those bins as high in order to put them on that shelf. Um, and it just means that we have to move things less far, which means you know, we're doing less work, which means we can do more of that less work um, before you know, uh, we get tired, we get fatigued. Um, we're done for the day. So the typically what we do is we put the, the dirty stuff on the left. So dirty stuff comes in on the left and then we're working left to right across the table. And then we have clean bins on the right. Um, these yellow bins are our shorter ones. The black ones are our taller ones. And so that lip is kind of set up so that a black one will still be below the level of the table. And we can essentially slide a lot of things right across the table as opposed to lifting them up. Again, saving work. Um, the wood uh, is a fairly soft, uh, forgiving surface, and so it's not going to scratch or dent or mar the, the vegetables as it's going across. There are some food safety concerns that I know some people have with it, and I'm happy to get into that more if that's a question that comes up from folks. Um, I've researched that some, and uh, based on my research, um, I'm very comfortable using the wood in this particular setting. It's also relatively inexpensive material in our area. Um, and it is um, easy to work with, um, uh, fairly durable for the particular use that we're using it for. And so um, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a good choice um, where we are. Um, the geometry has nothing to do with the material though. And so this geometry can be used just in terms of the width of the table, the depth of the table is also about two feet, which is about how far we can reach with our arms without having to bend over and put extra strain on our back. Um, it's got a backstop on it, which is that two by six in the back and that keeps things from falling off the back. So we don't have to chase things off the other side. You can't quite see this in the photo, but the two by six in the front is also a little bit proud of the surface of the table. So it creates a little bit of a lip to keep things from rolling off the front, but it's not too high to make it difficult to work with. There is, um, I'm gonna show you another picture here because I think you'll be able to see those slats a little bit better, kind of how a black bin uh, sets up. We, all, we have it set up. Um, so we have a hanging hose that keeps the hose off the ground. It also keeps it right in the um, working area, which is that red hose right there. Um, so you can use that with your hands or we have a hands-free shower head that's adjustable. Um, and that's that chromed piece that's um, sitting there. So you can spray with that if you prefer doing that. And then this is also not a good example of this, but I'll show you in the next slide, you can kind of just make out there's a, a metal, um, oops, there's a metal, um, uh, roofing underneath here. So that water, there's, this picture shows a puddle there, but that puddle is not actually from our spray water. It's um, from something else. But the, the water that's coming on the spray table is actually getting shunted off the back. So it's not landing on your feet and going into a gutter. And then that gutter is going away to a, uh, basically a ditch where we um, are able to get that water away from our work area. 
this is an example of a freestanding version of that same uh, work table, <clears throat> workbench. Um, and this freestanding version is, uh, you can maybe see the metal roofing a little bit better. It's at a 45 degree angle in the back there, which is both helping that water come off the back, but it's also providing a lot of structure. Um, and then this, is, this table is made out of pretty lightweight materials, um, two by twos and one by sixes. And the design for this is actually in my book. Um, and this is an example of not overbuilding something. So by not overbuilding this table and using what I typically see, which is two by fours and, and uh, two by sixes and those kinds of things, um, we're saving money, we're using less material, we're making a lighter weight, but just as functional table, which means that it's easier for us to move it around and reposition it when we need to reposition it. It's also easier to build because of those lighter weight materials, um, because all the pieces are uh, lighter and easier to handle. Um, so <clears throat> there, you don't want to necessarily make things heavy just to make them heavy. You want to put the material where it counts. And so we're using triangulation. Um, you can kind of see where that metal roofing is underneath. It's, uh, it's at that 45 degree angle, but that 45 degree angle is connecting to the back leg. And that's creating a triangle between the back leg and the, the tabletop or the skirt of the table. That keeps the leg from being able to move at all. And then that leg is tied to the front leg lower down. And so those legs are very stiffly held together. And over time, because they have such a stiff connection and strong connection, they're not gonna loosen up. <clears throat> Whereas if we were just attaching them at the top to the one by, um, when we first put them together, they might feel uh, stiff, but not they won't wobble, but that joint is seeing a lot of stress. And so <clears throat> over time, it's going to loosen up. Um, okay. Let's go to another one. Very similar. Um, we use wash tubs. We hang the hoses so that the wash tub can be filled. The wash tub is much heavier, though. So this is using two by four material. And again, you can see that triangulation in terms of holding the uh, legs together, maybe down there um, on the bottom. Again, we've set it so that the wash tub, the top of the wash tub is a good working height. Um, for the person. So this is a pretty low bench. It's only about a foot and a half off the ground because that wash tub is another foot and a half high, which puts that uh, working height at about three feet. <clears throat> and then we kind of have these arms, these um, shelves off the side for putting the, the um, dirty stuff on one side and then on the other side, the clean stuff that's coming out of the wash tub. Hand truck pallets, this is another design that's in my book, but just really, really simple for keeping stuff off the floor, um, making it easier for the hand truck nose to go in underneath. It's just a piece of plywood with two cleats on it. That's a whole stack of those pallets. You can see them in use right here underneath bins. It keeps the bins off the floor, which is a good thing for food safety. It also improves the air circulation, so it helps um, make the cooling more effective, actually. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, onion filler bag, this is another one that's in the book, but a uh, really awkward job was always filling these bags, trying to dump bins because we would harvest into bins and then we would wanna fill the, the bags with potatoes or onions. Um, so we're, um, what we do is we basically put 25 pounds onto a 40 pound scale, which you can see there in the foreground. And then that um, funnel is set up just right so that um, the bin uh, short side hooks onto that funnel and you can pour the potatoes down there. The funnel keeps them all contained. And then the bag is just held on. It's on a ramp. So the potatoes are rolling down as opposed to dropping and then bruising um, or the same thing with onions. Um, and it's just hooked on with the four uh, screw heads. Um, so you uh, quickly unhook it and tie the bag up and you're all good after you put two bins in there. So you've got a 50 pound bag all weighed out. Um, here's a <clears throat> wash pack table um, and a, with an adjustable height. This is another one that's in the book rolls around. So if you're on a concrete surface, it's got casters on it. So there's a bunch of ideas in there. And again, you'll see those triangle designs 
the triangle being a great way to stiffen up joints. If you go back to the physics and the twisting um, torque, the ideas of torque, um, I explain all of this in the appendix, appendix of the book. Um, I wanted to put it as the front of the book, but the editor was like, nobody's gonna read this if you start out with all the physics. So go read the book in the back of the book for all the, all the background information on that. Um, I wanna mention just a couple of other purchase uh, tools uh, before uh, we go to questions. Um, so I'm just gonna take a minute or two here. This is a, a Delta hitch, which is a faster way to hook up a three point, but it also ends up being a much safer way to hook up a three point implement on the back of a tractor. So basically you just, there's a mating piece to that on the back of the tractor. You just pull up to the back lift and it locks itself in place. So tools like this are really expensive up front, but they save time and they save injuries over time. Um, and in those ways, they can pay for themselves if you have cash flow up front. Another one of those tools is a pallet fork. Uh, so if you're using a tractor, we use the pallet forks for a lot of things um, on the back of tractors. I don't use them anymore because I don't use a four-wheel tractor anymore, but when I uh, was farming, kind of in the 10, uh, 20 acre range, uh, we use these a lot. Um, <clears throat> and so we'd use them for things, uh, macro totes of things, getting those out of the field. Um, but we'd also use them, and this is a place where you have to be super, super careful, but it is really effective. So we would have a, uh, when we're putting stakes out in the field, which we often do for trellising, we would have a, a pallet that was full of stakes and we could just pick up that pallet. And then that pallet, if you were, um, uh, thoughtful about the way that you drove with it, you could have somebody stand on that pallet also, which then means they're not climbing a ladder and they could, uh, the person that's on the ground can set the stake, uh, pull the stake off the pallet while the person uh, that's raised um, is able to do the pounding. So a lot of communication goes into setting up a system here where it works in order to do this completely safely um, because there is potentially high consequence if you do not do it safely. Um, but we were basically able to eliminate all those um, by setting up a, an appropriate system and at the same time eliminate a lot of the heavy work of moving the tea stakes out into the field, climbing up the danger and the difficulty of climbing up and down a ladder in order to be able to be tall enough to put out these tall stakes, um, things like that. Um, I'm going to skip over these hoe examples for a second. Um, same thing with the rakes. Um, to this wheel hoe and just mention, here's um, the tool that we probably use the most for cultivating in terms of space right now. Um, and this is a design that I really like. Um, and this is just a purchase tool, but I'm looking for these kinds of features when I'm purchasing things as well as designing them. And if I can't find them for purchase, then I'm going to think about designing my own or modifying a tool. But this has an adjustable handle with a quick release lever. There's this quick release lever that allows you to adjust the handle height for different users. Um, it also has these pin hitches for swapping out tools and there's room for two separate back-to-back -back tools. So we'll often use it with two blades or a blade and a rake, which more than doubles the effectiveness of that, of that particular tool. It's not appropriate for all conditions, um, but uh, being able to swap out the tools easily being able to make those adjustments on the fly. Um, those are fantastic features. Okay, so um, that's going back to the hand cart. Again, I've done that same hand cart, but now with some adjustable features, so quick release uh, on the handle height and um, also on the leg height. You can see that cart uh, with the flatbed on it and with some bins on it. Uh, and this is the final slide. Um, uh, one of the things I just want to mention, it's not in the book at all, but uh, I see a lot of potential for electric motors. And this is a little electric tiller um, called a Tilly that we used for a while. Um, and, and particularly in high tunnels, I think there's a lot of um, great applications for uh, electric uh, as opposed to internal combustion. And we should be going to electric on everything because it makes a lot more sense. The technology is just getting to be there at this point, but in the tunnels especially, it makes sense with um, reduced noise and also the reduced uh, um, fumes. Great, so it uh, looks like there's a couple of questions. 
Okay. There are, Josh. Thank you very much for uh, the great presentation. But that we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And um, the first one I have is from Sarah. And it came from when you were talking about the freestanding version of the work stand on that. Uh, what is your recommendation on where they might purchase similar bins that were there? Okay, so uh, might have been this one, might have been this one. I'm not sure. I'll tell yeah. you. So, <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, there's no great place, you know, one great place to buy these. Um, these black ones in the back are called bulb crates. And they are super, super common in the nursery industry um, for shipping bulbs. Um, so lots and lots of them come and the bulbs get uh, from typically from Europe over here. Um, and then uh, nurseries are, you know, it's just, it's some, it's packaging that they have to get rid of. And so we, in our area, there's a lot of nurseries, a lot of nurseries selling bulbs. And so they're available very commonly for a couple bucks a piece. Uh, at this point, I, and it's been a while since I bought them. So they're probably more than a couple bucks a piece at this point. Um, the yellow ones, um, uh, I, uh, you can see they came from a vineyard. So we bought them secondhand also. They last a good long time, probably 10, 15 years of, of hard use. Um, these are stack and nest um, totes. I, to tell you the truth, I can't remember the company. I have bought them before brand new. When you buy them new, typically you have to buy them by the pallet or, um, and they're quite expensive. So it, again, it's been a while since I bought them. They used to be uh, about, uh, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago, they were, you know, even at that point, they were 12 bucks a piece by the pallet quantity, which is like a hundred and some crates at a time. Um, I don't remember where they came in particular. I'm going to show you another one, which I really like, um, which are these. These are from a company called Intercrate, and they're called a swing bar tote. So they have these bars that swing one way and then it can uh, nest and they swing the other way and they can stack and it's really not if you if you have the money up front you can buy these things um, these are in that same price range as those yellow ones they come in different sizes so you can see the short version here and we got a taller version here um, and again intercrate sells them by the pallet i don't know people that are selling them one off but you probably could search around and maybe find that if you can find them used usually they still have good life left in them um because like i said you know 10 15 years of, of hard use um they'll last for that long and sometimes the bigger folks are getting rid of them after just a few years because they've gone to a new system great what i heard is networking is important as well whether you're working with folks in the floral industry um on the viniculture side etc that you guys all have things that can uh, work together collectively for uh, the good of the specialty crop industry yeah, and, and the other thing that I'll mention on that, it, it, you know, just in terms of that networking, one of the ways that a lot of the farms in our area have purchased these things is none of them needed necessarily a pallet quantity of things, but going to, in together on those bulk orders makes a big difference sometimes in terms of the price breaks that you can get. Great, Amy had a question um, right when we started uh, about a recommendation on a thermometer that may reach her, her greenhouse that's about 300 feet from her internet access to her house. Do you have any good recommendations on a thermometer? Yeah, so there's getting to be more and more of those available that are, you know, kind of Wi-Fi or, you know, some type of wireless <clears throat> uh, radio signal. Um, um, and I would actually look back uh, through growing from markets uh, feeds. I'm using one right now. I have been for the past year and a half or so been using one that I don't think has that kind of range. Um, it's a little bit shorter range, but you might be able to make it work. It's also not the most durable. It's really made more for kind of a home uh, application, but they're pretty cheap. And those are called wireless tag sensors. And I found them uh, moderately easy to use. Um, I would say they're not completely straightforward, but you know, kind of a little smartphone app and it's the amount of data that you can get out of them is pretty amazing. Um, 
but you know you kind of bump up to the next level. so those are you know the, i think those are like in the 20 to 30 dollar range for the sensor itself and then you have to have a there's actually a little radio signal thing that goes off of your wi-fi so to get into the system is probably more in the 100 150 dollar range depending on how many sensors you're buying um uh when you get into the the bigger ones i think there's a company called monet that you might look at um and there's a few others that i'm forgetting the names of um but those uh they're out there and I, unfortunately i can't give you a, um but they you know you, now you start getting into like two three hundred dollars because they're going to be more durable and they're going to hold up to those conditions and they're going to have the longer signal strength so i apologize that i can't give you a uh, you know no, that's fine. Name, but, uh, yeah. We have about three minutes left, four at the, at the tops on it. And I really want to ask you a question um, that came in about you know modifications and ergonomics and making sure things work so you're less fatigued, et cetera. Many, many of our producers are across generations. So we may have uh, children's parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and employees working. How do you make those adjustments for the, the different ages, heights, et cetera, with it when you've already made these modifications? How do you take it that next step further um, to be able to have a, a lot of different people working at that same same workstation? Right, so, <clears throat> so the example, I, I'm gonna just, uh, okay, so like this particular packing <clears throat> um, table, um, there's that black pin. I don't know if you can see that and there's holes in the side. And so you can actually adjust the table height um, more or less on the fly. You don't really want to have anything on the table. And this is a table that's in there. So one of the things that you can do is you can say, okay, well, I'm going to make the piece of equipment so that it's adjustable. Same thing on this. Um, I'm just uh, going ahead to this cart. Uh, the cart has an adjustable handle height. So there's this black quick release lever on the side so you can move the handle up or down for that for different height people. Um, same thing on this wheel hoe, it's got the quick release lever on the side, you can adjust that. So those are, you know, those are some tools that come with the adjustments in place. In terms of workstations, another thing to think about um, is if you're gonna build a fixed workstation like our fixed spray table height, <clears throat> um, build it for the tallest person and then make a lightweight but durable steady platform for the shortest person you know for the shorter people so that they you know it's kind of a little stage that they can stand on you got to make it big enough so that they're not going to accidentally fall off of it um, and you got to make it stable enough that it's not going to tip over or something um, and you got to make it light enough that you can easily get it into and out of place when they're working but that's kind of in a lot of uh scenarios that's actually the easiest thing to do is to make a little uh platform for people to to be raised up on in order to be working at the correct height well great thank you very much um with that we've answered all the questions and sammy i'll go ahead and turn it back over to you thank you josh and thanks dana and thank you all for joining us um to discover more resources or if you're interested in joining um our from the land of kansas um membership uh, just go to the chat and we'll drop a link there or follow us on Facebook to learn more about From the Land of Kansas. Um, in an effort to better understand a current workforce issues, trends, and needs within Kansas agriculture industry, the Kansas Department of Agriculture is calling on industrial partners to help identify workforce needs among agriculture employees in the state by conducting our second Kansas Agriculture Workforce Needs Assessment Survey. Kansas farmers, ranchers, agribusinesses, manufacturers, and producers of agriculture products are asked to complete the survey to help KDA identify the number and types of jobs in the state's agriculture industry um, and specific skills required for the jobs. The link will be in the chat and please fill out the survey um, no later than April 8th. Thanks for dropping in those links, Janelle. We will see you back here um, at 12 p.m with Olivia next Tuesday, and she will um, present on the importance of value-added products in our farm store. If you have any questions in the meantime, please email us at fromlandofkansas at ks.gov. And thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon and have fun celebrating um, Kansas and National Ag Day. Thank you.